Esophageal atresia. Esophageal atresia is a congenital defect where there is a defective or an absent continuation of the upper esophagus to the lower esophagus, thereby ending blindly instead. It is caused by an abnormal development of the tracheoesophageal septum. Esophageal atresia with a fistula connected distally to the trachea is the most common kind of esophageal malformation, which is classified as gross type C. It presents immediately after birth with cyanotic attacks, foaming at the mouth and cough. It is diagnosed when there is a failure to pass a feeding tube into the stomach. X-ray is mandatory for classifying the atresia and should show an air-filled pouch situated at the level of the third thoracic vertebra. Infants with suspected esophageal atresia cannot be fed orally because of the risk of aspiration pneumonia. There are a number of types of tracheoesophageal anomalies, but the five most common ones are classified as type A, type B, type C, D, and E. Type A is where there is esophageal atresia without tracheoesophageal fistula. Type B is when esophageal atresia is present with a tracheoesophageal fistula to the proximal esophageal segment. Type C is when there is esophageal atresia along with tracheoesophageal fistula to the distal esophageal segment, which is the most common variant. Type D is esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula to both the proximal and distal esophageal segments. And type E is tracheoesophageal fistula with no esophageal atresia. On ultrasound, esophageal atresia without a fistula, which is a type A esophageal atresia, is characterized by the presence of polyhydramnios. Polyhydramnios, which may not develop until the late second trimester, is present in about 100% of all the cases by the third trimester. A non-visualized stomach or collapsed stomach can be appreciated as two parallel echogenic lines in the upper abdomen, and a dilated proximal esophageal pouch can be seen in the neck or mediastinum. Esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula to both the proximal and distal can be difficult to diagnose prenatally, because the fistula allows the fluid to flow into the stomach. Now in this image of an ultrasound, the panel A shows a normal fetal stomach, whereas in panel B there is absent fetal stomach and polyhydramnios. Polyhydramnios occurs in approximately a third of all the fetuses with esophageal atresia with a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. So what is the pathophysiology underlying the formation of a tretic esophagus? Now brushing our embryology concepts a little bit, recall that tracheoesophageal septum, which is a wedge of mesoderm, separates the developing foregut from the trachea. Esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula are due to a defect in mesodermal differentiation. About 50% of the cases are associated with other mesodermal defects and can be memorized by the famous mnemonic VACTRL, where V stands for vertebral anomalies, A for anal atresia, cardiac anomalies, tracheoesophageal fistula, esophageal atresia, renal anomalies, and limb malformations. So what are the clinical features that point towards esophageal atresia? Polyhydramnios due to the fetus being unable to swallow the amniotic fluid is a common feature found prenatally. Polyhydramnios is not a symptom in patients with gross type E atresia because the esophagus is connected to the stomach and allows fluids to pass, resulting in an increased risk of premature birth. Whereas postnatally, esophageal atresia results in pooling of the secretions causing excessive secretions or foaming at the mouth. If the fistula is connected to the proximal esophageal segment, aspiration can occur and subsequently can result in aspiration pneumonia. And patients with aspiration pneumonia can present with coughing spells, rails, and cyanotic attacks. Coughing spells are due to the saliva overflowing from the esophagus into the trachea. 
If the fistula is connected to the distal esophageal segment, there can be gastric distension. Note that the newborns usually present with symptoms immediately after birth, but the only exception to remember is the gross type E fistula for the obvious reason that there is only minimal or no atresia or obstruction. The diagnosis of a small H-type tracheoesophageal fistula may occur as late as adulthood in some cases. Diagnostic modalities that can be of help include placement of a feeding tube. The feeding tube cannot pass through the esophagus in the case of esophageal atresia. An x-ray of the thorax or abdomen can show esophageal pouching, except in the type E, which is an H-type fistula, whereas gross type A and type B present with a gasless abdomen. Further diagnostics concerning bacterial anomalies should be performed using an ultrasound of the abdomen or echocardiography. Treatment of esophageal atresia with a tracheoesophageal fistula, preoperatively, an oroesophageal or a nasoesophageal tube should be placed for continuous suction of secretions and it is extremely vital to prevent aspiration and to facilitate breathing. And antibiotics are recommended in cases of aspiration pneumonia. Note that infants who potentially have esophageal atresia should not be fed orally under any circumstances. Surgical treatment should be performed within the first 24 hours of birth and the goal of the surgery is to reconnect the upper esophageal pouch and the lower end of the esophagus. A long gap between both the ends of the esophagus may not allow primary repair and in such instances, a gastrostomy tube is used to allow enteral feeding.